For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we're very delighted and happy to have His Grace Ambangelus with us. Of course, we all know um, Sayedna from the um, youth conventions, and you know I personally know Sayedna from uh, 1995 very early on, and he uh, was and is still great an inspiration to, uh, to all of us. Uh, he's someone who says the word uh, of truth and um, uh, says it with enthusiasm and uh, in, a, in a very powerful way, and uh, he's a great inspiration to a lot of us clergy and, and youth, and a lot of people take him as a great example. We're very happy that, that Sayedna took part of his schedule to be with us tonight, and we we pray to take this uh, um, amazing blessing uh, tonight. Good evening, everybody. I always feel like I'm running an advertisement for Apple when I switch on my, uh, my laptop. I'm just not seeing it. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here with all of you, and um, I think I was trying to figure out when I was here last time, and it turned out to be six years ago. So uh, my next uh, trip, inshallah, will be 2018. Um, unless uh, you're really lucky, it may be 2024 then, right? <laughs> no, but it's great to be here, and it's, it's wonderful to be with the fathers here. Thank you for their invitation and their love, and um, it's always good to be back against brothers, uh, amongst brothers, and to be able to serve with them and be able to serve you all. And um, we've been doing a lot of things today, um, speaking about our brothers and sisters back in Egypt and how we can help them and how we can do things for them and um, most of all, we need to, to pray so that uh, God continues to see that His will is done. And we're confident in our prayers. We don't pray defeated. We don't pray because that's all we have. We pray because that is all we have. And that is the most important thing, and it's the starting point. And it's a blessing for us to be part of this work. I, um, I wanted to, tonight, speak to you about something which I think we have a lot of trouble with. And something we don't really like to speak about, let alone actually do. And that is the concept of obedience. Why is it that we obey? Why is it that we do what we think we are asked to do? Whether you are a teenager, or you're someone who's growing up, or someone at work, or someone at university, there'll be something you have to obey. And we have a lot of trouble with obedience. So, we, we need maybe to address two points. The first, um, and this may not make sense initially, but I'm sure it'll make sense hopefully by the end of it, is the concept of the Trinity. And the second is what we learn from it concept of the Trinity, what we learn from it. 
Let me share with you um, a definition of what the Trinity is. When you look at the definition of a Trinity, of the Trinity, we read this. It is a single God who is both three and one, triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in essence and undivided. The Holy Trinity is three unconfused and distinct divine persons who share one divine essence. Right? So we have two words we want to focus on here. One is unconfused, and two is that they share one divine essence. Does that make sense so far? Okay. The second quote I want to share with you is from St. Gregory of, of Nyssa. And he says of the Trinity, their nature is one, at union in itself, and an absolutely indivisible unit, not capable of increasing or addition or diminution or subtraction, but in its essence being and continuing as one, inseparable even though it appears to be plural. Let's break that down. He says, first of all, that they are an absolutely indivisible unit. God is indivisible as Trinity. There are the three persons. Each has his identity and his function. But as Trinity, God is always God. And he says that they continue and remain as one. They don't suddenly fragment. God is always one. The third comment, and I, I promise you this may make sense soon. If it doesn't, I'm sorry, but it may make sense soon. The third is a statement from St. Gregory Nazianzen, who says, all that belongs to the Son is the Father's. Nothing then is peculiar because all things are in common. Okay, so we have that they are unconfused and share one divine essence. They ha we have that they are an absolutely indivisible unit and they remain and continue to be one. And we have that there is nothing peculiar and all things are in common. So what does that have to do with what we want? If we look at the dynamics between the Trinity, we look at the obedience of the Son, God the Son, to God the Father. What do we see? He shows us that it's easy, that it's natural. Why would obedience be easy and natural? How can obedience be easy and natural? Obedience is sometimes the most difficult thing we must do. It can only be easy and natural if I buy into and accept what I'm being told. So if Abuna asks me to do something and I'm convinced, then I will find it easy and natural to obey the, com the command or the request. Why? Because I'm convinced, because I buy into it. You know this concept of having ownership of something. When someone tells you something, if you have ownership, then you believe in it and you practice it, you will do it. I also find it easy and natural if it becomes mine. So if what a Buna wants is what I want, Therefore, again, it becomes in easy and natural. And in that context, it becomes easy, natural, and it becomes dynamic. It's something that's just moving. It's fluid. 
It's not jerky. It's not as if, okay, I need to stop and think, do I do it, do I not do it? Am I convinced, am I not convinced? It's just natural. And you see it quite often with your friends. People you know, someone will say something, you know the other person, you're convinced, you understand, you buy into it, it belongs to you, it's there. It's done. It, it's seamless, it's fluid. And that is why for obedience, if we are really going to be obedient to God, we need what St. Paul asks us of, that asks of us, and that is a transformation of our minds. My mind needs to be transformed, it needs to be changed. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what it's saying here is, through the transformation of my mind, I will prove that perfect and acceptable will of God. How is that going to happen? Because in that transformation, and this is the wonderful thing about linking the scriptures, not just taking one verse on its own, linking the scriptures. If we go then from Romans 12, 2, of the perfect will of God being transformed into Corinthians 5, 17, we read, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. What am I getting at here? It's quite simple. If my mind is transformed, if I put on the new man, if I am changed and become that new creation, what is that new creation? It is a new creation that is in line with God and in line with the will of God, then of course, I'll be able to be obedient. Because my new mind, my new person, my transformed being will be that which proves what is good and acceptable and the, is the perfect will of God. Because I will no longer be thinking of my own accord alone. I will be thinking with the mind of Christ. And so, of course, if I'm thinking with the mind of Christ, then what he says to me will make sense. What he asks of me will make sense. What he wants me to do will make sense. And so obedience and confirmation will be natural. If we look at the Gospel of St. John chapter 17, which is a wonderful chapter about unity, What is essential is that our Lord prays and says that they may be one as you and I, Father, are one. Why does he want us to be one as he and the Father are one? Why? Are we going to be God? Am I going to be God incarnate? Am I going to become the second hypostasis of the Trinity? Am I going to be the Savior who is crucified and resurrected? Of course not. What I am going to be is one as they are one. And if we go back to those first statements that I read to you, what does that mean? It means they are absolutely indivisible. They are sharing an essence. They have all things in common. They are unconfused. And so if I and God the Father are one, then I also have these things. Not with a divine essence because I'm not God, but then I will have all things in common with him. We so often focus 
on a forced obedience that we forget the basic, basic ingredient. What is it? The basic ingredient is that I need to be part of him and he needs to become part of me. And that is the way to obey. Ephesians 4, 24. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So if I am transformed into that new person who was created in righteousness and holiness, how is it that I will not obey the will of God? How would that work? How is it that I will not, with fluid action, naturally link in to that will of God? It becomes second nature. Don't forget that we all fell because of disobedience and conflict in the old Adam. But we were all raised because of obedience and oneness in the new Adam. So in the old Adam, we were confused. We were in conflict. We wanted something that was not of the mind of God. And so we fell. But in the new Adam, he came obedient. And in that obedience, and in that love, he raised us. He rose and he raised us with him. One thing we know about God is that he is perfect. And so anything he does is perfect. So when we look at the obedience of the Son to the Father, it is a perfect obedience. It is unconditional. Now we often may have partial obedience. We may have conditional obedience, but it doesn't work. Because conditional obedience is not really obedience. Conditional obedience is just, I'll decide when I want and I'll decide when I don't. Sounds really nice, right? Sounds very simple. Sounds great. But it's not. And we all know it's not simple. There are going to be obstacles. There are going to be difficulties. I will sometimes have trouble accepting, right? It's easy to talk about perfect obedience when we are talking about God incarnate. When we are talking about ourselves, it is not that easy and it is not that natural. Sometimes I will have those times when I am standing there saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Why have you left me? And there are other times when I will be kneeling there praying as our Lord did in Matthew 26, 42 and say, Oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, let your will be done. I'm reluctant. I don't really want it. But let your will be done. That's the answer. The answer is I will sometimes have a struggle. And it will sometimes be very difficult. But I must trust enough to say, let your will be done. 
Obedience comes out of two things. Comes out of complete conviction and complete acceptance or it comes out of a trust that says, you know what, I don't know everything. I don't understand everything. I'm not sure. But I trust you enough. I trust you enough to put my hand to my life in your hands. And I trust you enough to know that you will want what is right for me. It is expected that we are sometimes going to ask that question, why have you left me? Can't you take this cup away? And it is expected that we will even struggle. Don't be upset if you struggle. Don't be shocked if, you're, if you struggle. It is part of our humanity because we don't have that complete trust. But once you receive the answer, after the struggle, do not reject it. Once you receive the answer, embrace it. You see, we sometimes use time to our benefit. If I'm praying about something, or I'm asking for something, and I receive a certain message, sometimes I think, if I wait for long enough, the message will change. You know, I'll, I'll just wait this one out. It's like playing chicken with God. Right? It's, no, I'll, I'll hold out. I, I, I won't, maybe, just maybe he'll change his mind. And the message is so clear. The message is crystal clear. But I just don't like it. So if I'm going to go down the road of, I trust you, so therefore, even if this cup will not be taken away from me, let your will be done. I need to accept it completely. As I was saying earlier, obedience cannot be conditional. You're either obedient or you're disobedient. You can't be partially obedient. If I ask you to take this cross and put it on that pew, you either are going to take it and put it there, in which case it's obedience, or you're going to take it and maybe place it along the way somewhere. That's not partial obedience. Is it there or not? Did it make that pew? If it's yes, obedience. No, it hasn't arrived. We can't just want to be obedient sometimes. But again, having said that, we must realize we are a work in progress. So that complete obedience is built over time. And it's built with a relationship. We often, I think, look at the scriptures and look at some of our readings, for instance, like the Synaxarium. And we want to be, you know, super saint overnight. We, we listen to these wonderful accounts of the saints. And we think, that's who I want to be. And we don't realize that was built up over so long. Have I invested in that obedience to be built up and over so long? Will God want absolute obedience from me in a life-threatening situation instantly? Of course not. He puts me through so many other stages of my life. 
I obey as a child. I obey as an adolescent. I obey as a teenager. I obey as long a, a young adult. And I keep obeying in things that become greater and greater and greater and greater. So that when it comes to something that is huge, I'm not going to go from, listen, this is my life, nothing to do with you, I'm doing it myself, and suddenly jump to, God, I'm all yours, please take me. It doesn't work that way. You think of your own relationships with people. Over how long has your trust been built? It's been built over time. And it's been built through experience. You know, the, the one thing about obedience, and that's one thing I want you to all think about. You will always end up being obedient to something or someone. Always. Whether it's, you know, as with the cartoons, you know, good angel on the right or bad devil on the left, on the shoulders, whether it's my own head, or my confession father, or my parents, or my servants, or my friends, or the advertising executive who's sitting in, in his office creating an advertising campaign that is going to make you buy item X. Or the music executive who is producing artist Y who makes you buy that single or makes you buy that song or makes you buy that, that, that CD, that soundtrack. We're going to obey someone. Don't ever, ever think for a minute that your choices are completely free and open. Your choices are controlled and are affected by something or other. Now, do I want to be the person who is tossed with the waves of this world? where one thing helps me decide today, then a different thing helps me decide tomorrow. Where there is one fashion today, another tomorrow. One fad today, another tomorrow. One opinion today, another tomorrow. Or do I want to be of that one mind with Christ, having all things in common, being inseparable, having the new man being transformed in my mind, accepting and trusting him and saying, I'm yours. Saying, I don't want to think that much for myself because there are times when I'm not going to know the answer. But I want to be obedient to your voice because I know that your voice is the one that will lead me. Your voice is the one that will guide me. Your voice is the one that will save me. If I listen to anything else, it will fall short. If I listen to anything else, I will stray. But if I listen to you, I know, I understand. I accept. Romans 6.16 Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, with a sin leading to death, or obedience leading to righteousness. You end up obeying something. Which are we going to want to obey? And that's a choice we need to make. St. John Kronstadt writes, the new man in Christ finds pleasure in obedience, while the old man wishes to resist. Therefore, O Lord, your will be done. 
I accept as an expression of your will all that is required of me. The new man in Christ finds pleasure in obedience. How many of us can say we find pleasure in obedience? At best, we will obey and grumble. At best, we will obey reluctantly. At best, we will obey and stomp our feet and walk away saying, you know what, God, I believe you, I trust you, but this is not what I wanted. Are we at the level where we can say, as a new person in Christ, I find pleasure in obedience? I don't find pleasure in getting what I want. I don't find pleasure in you doing what I have asked. I just find pleasure in obeying you. Because I know that you have my best interests, my salvation at heart. I know that you will not leave me. So where does my faith come from? My faith comes from being, and if we sort of try to join all of these together, this sort of long journey that I started off probably confusing you, and now hopefully having lessened the confusion a little bit at least. What does my faith come from? My faith should come from being inseparably joined to an omnipotent and omniscient God with whom I have gradually built an unshakable relationship. So, that faith comes from me being inseparably joined. I can't opt out. I don't want to opt out. To an all-powerful and all-knowing God. All-powerful because he will always protect me. All-knowing because he will always guide me. all-powerful and all-knowing God with whom I have gradually not on today, off tomorrow I have gradually and consistently built an unshakable relationship a relationship that is not based on how I feel today it's not based on what he gave me today it is unshakable because it is based on my relationship with him that has been built up. Okay. So that's one part, that obedience. Now, let's put this to the test. There's one incredible account of obedience that we had a retreat about, about three weeks ago, and I'm still thinking about it. And it's mind-boggling. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 12. I'm sure you know this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Adam, uh, Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Now, this story is bad enough, but when God decides to press on every possible sore point, it becomes almost unbearable. Abraham is there minding his own business. God calls upon him, Abraham, he says, Lord, here I am. Abraham, I want you to take your son. Yes. Your only son. God, I know he's my only son. You gave him to me. Your only son. I know. You gave him to me with a miracle after so many years. I had lost hope. I had no idea this was going to happen. I didn't think it was possible, but you gave it to me. My only son. Whom you love. What are you getting at? 
He is my son, my only son, whom I love. Isaac, Lord, get on with it. What, what do you want me to do? You're making me nervous here. And go to the land of Moriah. And there, offer him as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will tell you of. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Put yourself in the place of Abraham. How would you feel? What would you do? Would you run like Jonah, hoping that God couldn't see you? Or would you just disobey like Samson and do what you wanted to do? Or would you pretend to be strong like St. Peter, yet at the end deny? What would you do? Which one of those would you do? I have no idea what I'd do. Such a difficult position to be in. The son of joy? The son of laughter? You want me to take him and to offer him as a burnt sacrifice? That's verses 1 and 2. What does verse 3 say? So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place that God told him of. Really? Just that simple? That was it? This is Abraham who negotiated for Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Abraham who said, if I find ten righteous people. He didn't want to advocate for his own son? How? This is Abraham who, when he feared Pharaoh, said that his wife was his sister. Abraham, what's wrong with you? It basically just went on and said, so Abraham rose early. So, that word so is just, is just mind-boggling. God said this, so he did that. No stomping of the feet, no reluctance, no complaint, no negotiation. He just did it. There was no delay and no question asked. Why? My understanding, my reflection, from what I've read, from what I've heard, from my own thoughts, it's because he experienced God. He knew. There must be something. God's going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I know my God. He is a generous God. He is the one who gave me the son of laughter in the first place. He is the one who gave me the son of hope in the first place. I don't know what he plans to do. I don't know what he's getting at. But he had that obedience. Obedience is not just doing what is easy. Obedience is not just doing what is convenient or not just following what makes sense. Obedience is obedience. Verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Three days. Imagine traveling for three days, not knowing what was coming. Okay, God, I trust you, but what's next? What are you getting at? The uncertainty. Even sometimes if we have obedience, we don't have patience. I don't want to wait to see the fulfillment of what God wants. 
You know, we don't like waiting 15 minutes. Three days journeying with his son by his side, whom he was supposed to offer as a burnt sacrifice. What kind of journey was that? How did he cope? What was he thinking? Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Was he lying? We will come back to you. Or was that faith? Something was going to happen. I don't know what. This is inconsistent with what God usually wants of me, so I'm just going to trust him. We will come back to you. I and my son, there are only two of them going. We will come back. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. This was a bit of a struggle for someone so advanced in years. Now this is the thing. We're talking about Isaac here. How old was he? We don't know. But for most writers, people who have reflected on this, he was a young man. He was someone who could have gone on a three-day journey with his father, away from his mother. So, late teens, early twenties, a young man who's thinking, Father, you brought me to offer a sacrifice. Here's the wood. Here's the knife. Here's the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice? What does Abraham say? My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went off. Who was learning the lesson here? Was it Abraham or was it Isaac? Who was this lesson for? Was it Abraham to learn to trust God or Isaac to learn to trust? Something was wrong. Where's the sacrifice? What am I doing? Where are we going? Why this odd behavior? Beautiful, beautiful reflection I came across. Changed my perception completely. Senefram the Syrian writes, in two things then, Adam, uh, Abraham, I keep calling him Adam, I don't understand why. Abraham is victorious. That he killed his son, although he did not actually kill him. For he believed that Isaac, even if he had died, he would rise again. Think, what's the reasoning behind that? So do you understand the reasoning? He didn't kill him, so he was victorious. It's a win-win situation. But in his mind, in St. Ephraim's reflection, even if he killed him, Abraham in his own mind, knew that somehow God would raise him again. Why? Because he had told him that through Isaac, your descendant shall be named. How could that be if he's dead? You see, God must make sense. So if God had promised Abraham that through your son Isaac, your descendants shall be named. 
And then he says to him, go and kill your son. Either, and this is, this is why he must have said, and we will come back to you. Either God is going to stop me last minute, or even if Isaac dies, he's going to raise him again, because God does not go back on his promises. Can you see the way that this links in? God doesn't go back on his promises. And if he promised me that, Abe, that Isaac would be the one through whom my descendants would be named, then so shall it be. What is the litmus test of God's will? A verse that is very, very dear to me. And I always hold it in my mind whenever anything is getting difficult. In Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts I think of you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you future and hope. So even the thought of God towards Abraham at this time were thoughts of good and not evil, thoughts that would give him future and hope. Now, how does that fit in with offering his own son as a sacrifice? He didn't know. But what he knew was that the mind of God had within it for him good and not evil, future and hope. And that's where trust is. And on the other side, Isaac, who didn't understand, Isaac, who was there, when his father took him up, his father bound him. Now we're talking about a man, very advanced in years, binding a young man who was very strong. Why didn't you push him away? Why didn't he struggle? Again, in Isaac's mind, what was it? I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Good and not evil, future and hope. So who was this lesson for in obedience? Was it Abraham who followed God's will? Or was it Isaac who stood there and submitted? Again, confident. You know, just as the ram was there waiting for Abraham's sacrifice, so too was the resurrection there waiting for the entombed son. There was always a way out in God's mind. There was always a resurrection. And for everything we go through, no matter how difficult it seems, there will always be a resurrection waiting around the corner, or there will always be a lamb, a ram tied, waiting for us. Something that baffled me after we had this retreat I was driving a week later on a country road in England. I was still thinking about this. And I looked over and saw a shepherd with some goats. And one of the goats, sure enough, was stuck with its head in a hedge, entangled. And I thought, that's what it looks like. That wasn't easy to do in a random place, but God provided. And that's why, verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. So what do we come out of this with? 
whether you are Abraham or you are Isaac, whoever you are, have confidence and know that God has your best interests at heart. Romans 14.8, as we conclude. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. I'm going to go up that mountain. I provide the sacrifice, I offer the sacrifice, I don't. I'm Isaac. I go up the mountain. If I come back or I don't, I am the Lord's. I'm in his hands. I am his mind. I'm inseparable. I am constantly with him. I trust him. I believe him. I know his heart for me. I know he wants good and not evil, future and hope. I know that all things work together for the perfect will of God. And I know that if I trust him and if I obey, I obey him, then only good things can come out of that. Because then I will have not my own mind, not my own assessment, but I will have the mind of Christ being renewed in his way, having his perfect will fulfilled and working towards that future, that hope, and that goodness that he promised. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Can I ask you to just take a moment to reflect on that, please? Just put your heads down and reflect on it. Do you have any comments or questions? No comments, no questions? All right, before we finish, I want you to give me five points we're walking away with. Anything that sticks in your mind? One. We'll take questions downstairs. One. If you don't offer, I'm going to point. Unity with the Trinity, thank you. But Abuna doesn't count, I still want five. He's trying to bail you out, but it's not good enough. This is your father taking, you know, taking your place in sacrifice. One, yes. You're always being obedient to something, make sure you're obedient to the right thing, thank you. Two, hang on, hand, 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 someone over here. Trust in the Lord, thank you. Three, over there. Sorry? Which one are you going to be? Abraham or Isaac? Be obedient as both. Thank you. Mind transformation to have the mind of Christ. Someone over here. Obedience with time becomes easy and natural and fluid. Thank you. Someone had a hand up here. No? Yes. Be in a true relationship with God so we can learn to be obedient. Yes, I'll take three more. <laughs> Sorry? God has your best interest at heart, but you've said two, so I still want three. Yes. <laughs> obedience is not just out of convenience. Thank you. Um, we'll answer that downstairs. <laughs> two more. And go up to the Two more. Sorry? Yes, when God gives you a choice and decision, you take it. And last one, someone on this side. There is no halfway obedience. There is either obedience or disobedience, but obedience and the relationship is built up gradually over time so that it becomes firm and it becomes part of who we are. And glory be to God forever. Uh, what? What? Yes? Just one more point. You want more point? Obedience comes, out of conviction. Obedience comes out of conviction. Thank you. I'm glad we waited for that one. 
There's always resurrection and there's always a ram waiting to be offered in your place. Glory be to God forever. Amen.